At all times, tracks, trail and highways served humanity as keys to evolution. Empires and civilizations disappeared. Centuries-old dust swept capitals and cities. But roads kept on breathing life back into them. Do we really understand how roads revitalized areas hundreds of years ago? And how they affect people's destinies today? We go on the Treasures of the Nation expedition to reveal facts about life at the crossroads of antiquity. Modern motorways are very much new, but if a trail is left, it will surely be found even thousands of years later. Where is the homeland of metallurgy? When did the first razor appear? How are iron earpick and spaceship connected? You cannot imagine modern roads without metal. For example, about 200 tons of metal are needed to build one kilometer of railway tracks. Metal is also used for construction of highways, and not only in the form of road signs, fencing and other obvious objects. Metal slag is often used to build road embankments or beds. Mind you, not that much time ago, metal itself was considered by humans as an impossible wonder. To learn how the centuries-long battle for metal unfolded, our expedition invites you to take a journey along the paths of ancient metallurgists. From afar, Temir Tau looks like a huge furnace lying in the middle of the steppe. During the Soviet period, this place was called the nation's smith shop. And it is likewise true nowadays. The city located in central Kazakhstan covers the metal needs of not only our home state, but also many neighboring countries. The treasures of the nation expedition came here to see with our own eyes how metal is produced today. Konstantin, hello. Yes, it is my pleasure to meet you. Will you show us around? Of course. We are now entering the second blast furnace hall which underwent complete reconstruction in 2012. It was fully upgraded. The modern process of metal production significantly differs from the images we saw in Soviet film promotion. The foundry yard here is completely closed and metal does not flow now in open trenches. There are very few people working in close proximity to the furnace. Hydraulic equipment is used to open and close the hatches. Corporal refrigerators ensure the cooling of the furnace shaft. This huge 50-meter high furnace is absolutely new. Practically all technological processes taking place inside and around it are fully automated. And the metallurgists are very much enthusiastic about the installation. An inclined bridge is located at the end face of the whole building, with two maneuvering skip hoists. The hoists are loaded with dose materials like charred coal, ore, agglomerate and pellets. Further on, the raw materials go into the special unit called Kalashnik on top of the furnace. After that, two special bunkers, and only then they are transferred to the furnace itself. The furnace blasting gets into the furnace via a special ring air duct with simultaneous feeding of oxygen and heating oil. Melted materials go down into the so-called well. Every 50 minutes, the furnace men, together with the master, open the tapping arrangement to release the melted materials. After that, the cast iron produced at this stage flows along a special ditch and via closed trenches to the converter shop. Do you mean to say that cast iron is flowing under our feet as we speak? Exactly. The transferred trench where the splitting takes place passes right under us. The slag goes to the slag processing shop, where it is used to make crushed stone and residue used afterwards in road construction and other building works. Cast iron ends up in the converter shop and undergoes further processing to transform it into steel. It is a known historical fact that during the Great Patriotic War not a single unit of arms, military equipment and ammunition was produced without the participation of Kazakhstan's metallurgy. Only half a century back, this industry produced a quarter of all cast iron manufactured in the Soviet Union, and by 2010 amounted to a quarter of the GDP of independent Kazakhstan. About 30% of all its export revenues the country receives from the two priority sectors of economy mining and metallurgy. How dangerous the production and the work here is with all the melted metal around. It is quite dangerous. How difficult it was to produce metal in the old days. Most likely it was pretty hard. Working with metal at present, it is hard for me to imagine how they manipulated melted metal barehanded back then. It is really hard to say exactly how they did it. 
I'm sure it was pretty tough and out of common. This is exactly what we're trying to investigate. The overall scale and technologies of modern metal production are truly impressive. The questions for us are how metallurgy originated and what it looked like back in those days when humans only started to learn how to master this new material. From Timir Tao, the expedition goes to Karaganda to meet Professor Sagandik Jaumbai, who has been studying ancient metallurgy of central Kazakhstan for over 40 years. We do hope to get some answers. Sagandik Aga, could you show some items dating back to the Bronze Age that were found exactly here in Karaganda? A lot of copper artifacts had been found in the settlement of Alat. These ones we found this year. For example, this element of horse bridles. They would fix it like this while putting the bridles over the horse's head. He was linked with a bit. The assembly was called toga. Or this one, for example. We find a lot of elements made of wood and bone. To plane down wooden and bone objects, the ancient people used bronze scrapers. On this end here there was probably some kind of handle. This is a pricker and this is a needle. The main types of clothing and footwear were made of animal skins. Basically everything was made of leather. And they used such tools to sew their clothes. Prior to that they probably made them of bone, but it was not sufficiently strong and durable. Therefore they began to make them out of bronze. Among the multiple bronze artifacts that we found here, we even have a cast razor dating back to the 13th century BC. As of today, this is the oldest razor found in central Kazakhstan. Our ancestors used it to shape their moustaches and beards. This is real, only the handle bent a little. How about that? More than 3500 years ago, people in these parts had been already shaving. It basically means that, as to personal hygiene, they didn't lag behind the same ancient Egypt, where they also used bronze razors. An interesting theory says that ancient Romans called the unshaven wild people barbarians from the Latin word barba, or beard. So it turns out that the people they used to live in these parts by default cannot be called barbaric. As a mandatory accessory of masculine beauty, the razor underwent extensive evolution. But until until the very end of the 19th century, when safety razors appeared, and the 70s of the 20th century, when electric razors came into being, it remained practically unchanged and looked exactly like this razor casted in the 13th century BC by the metallurgists of central Kazakhstan. In addition, we have a lot of bronze foodware. Our ancestors made their pots and dishes not only from clay, but also from bronze, the so-called ceremonial ware. Probably wealthy people used it for various celebrations, holidays and feasts. Later, during the Saka times, they started to produce such ware of gold and silver. But the first samples were made of bronze. Well, the most numerous finds are raro heads. This one, for example, was most likely used for hunting small animals. Arrowheads like these ones here were made specifically for military action. This is exactly the reason why we had managed to seize such huge territory. It was thanks to the power of the metal. Were all these items produced locally or brought from somewhere? What is your take on that? Any evidence? Metal mastery spread from this land to other regions. For example, based on chemical and metallographic tests by Chernikov, the raw bronze and bronze weapons produced in Atasu had been delivered as far as the Ukraine. Already in the middle of the 20th century, Alkei Magulan, the legendary Kazakhstan historian, archaeologist and ethnographer, claimed that bronze items manufactured in Karaganda and Zhezkazgan reached southern Siberia via eastern Kazakhstan. Later on, Japanese professor Murakami proved that iron spread worldwide from central Kazakhstan. Via eastern Kazakhstan it came to Altai, from there to China, further out to Korea and only then it reached Japan.
Whereas similar furnaces found in Japan date back to the 3rd century AD, for central Kazakhstan we are talking about the 13th century BC. 1,000 years difference. Can you imagine that? 1,000 years. In the settlement of Atasu, 25 furnaces were found dating back to the time of the so-called Developed Bronze Age. In modern terms, it was a large-scale copper melting operation similar to present-day Jeska's gun, Balkash or Temyatau plants. The settlement of Alat is yet another interesting center of ancient metallurgy. It is about 3,500 years old. This is the only settlement like this in Kazakhstan that existed for 500 years and where they melted corporate first and then iron. This is why the settlement of Alat is included in the list of 100 sacred places of Kazakhstan. Thus, our ancestors had mastered bronze in the 3rd millennium BC and started to process iron at the end of the 2nd millennium BC. In addition to the actual bronze items, archaeologists also managed to find direct evidence of the existence of metallurgical production in ancient central Kazakhstan. Elements of ancient metal melting furnaces. These are the nozzles through which air was fed into furnace, like this. What are they made of? They are made of burnt clay. The slight glazing that you see was the result of high temperature. 1500 degrees is pretty hot, as you can imagine. Once again, these nozzles were used to drive air into the furnace. In this case, what are the most ancient centers of copper and dyne production in the world? There are several such centers around the world, and central Kazakhstan undoubtedly represents one of them. That was due to the fact that our land was and is rich in copper, tin and in particular iron. Our ancestors started to utilize this immense wealth very early in human history. The Middle East is one of the most ancient centers of human civilization and nobody could refute that. But metallurgical technologies did not arrive in our days from there. In the 3rd millennium BC, it was exactly here in Kazakhstan where our ancestors had learned to melt metals and use them for their benefit. In any case, it is a historical fact that iron smelting furnaces had appeared in the territory of central Kazakhstan 500 years earlier than in other places, be it Europe or the whole Eurasia. Of course, due to the present Eurocentric concept of human development, they don't even want to mention this. But the increasing number of artifacts like furnaces, working tools and weapons, which we are talking about every day, prove that the center of our civilization was located in our parts. Central Kazakhstan has yet another famous ancient metallurgy center, the city, the name of which itself reminds of bronze ringing, Zhezkazgan, which translates from Kazakh as the one digging copper. In thirst of revealing other secrets of ancient metallurgists, the treasures of the nation expedition went to the copper city to have a word with archaeologist Gabdullah Wezer. Tell us, please, about the unusual metal artifacts exhibited in your museum. Zhezkazgan Historical and Archaeological Museum has an extensive collection of various instruments of production made of copper and iron. Arrow and spearheads and even a skith. The most unusual for modern days and unique artifact that we possess is the medieval iron earpick or kopoushka, as it was called. Such items are extremely rare. Kopoushka or earpick is a hygienic accessory for cleaning ears that was widely used across all Eurasia since the first millennium BC. Earpicks were found in Hunnic, Gothic and Avarian monuments of the early Middle Ages in Western Europe as well as specifically on the territory of present-day France, Italy and China. 
Often they served not only as pragmatic tools of personal care, but also as charms. We haven't seen anything like this before, that's for sure. What do you think about the theory that the Bronze Age began in Jeskazgan in Karaganda region? Did metal processing technologies originate there or came from somewhere else? As Alke Margulan stated, central Kazakhstan should be considered the homeland of metallurgy. From the purely scientific point of view, on the one hand, it is not yet a proven fact. On the other hand, the formation of such metallurgical centers as Atasu and Taldisai do prove the existence of ancient metallurgical hubs in central Kazakhstan. As befits a center of metallurgy, it turned out that Jeskaz Gan has yet another specialized museum operating under the auspices of Kazakh Miss Corporation and devoted specifically to the history of metal production and processing. The abundant historical treasures of the museum shed light on the origins of metallurgy. Please meet archaeologist Arman Bermagambetov. Arman, is it true that the most ancient sites of bronze development, production and processing are located here in Jeskaz? Kazgan. Let's start with some general information. The fact is that in ancient time, Jeskazgan was located on a caravan track connecting countries of the West with India and China. Metal, first of all bronze, that was manufactured here in large volumes was naturally one of the main types of traded goods. What evidence and artifacts prove that they processed bronze and copper here at that time? First of all, it's the instruments of production, that is, tools used to extract ore. Here on the table you can see a whole spectrum of tools which prove beyond any doubt that they extracted metal ores in this region during the Bronze Age, about 4,000 to 4,500 years ago, maybe even 5,000 years ago. I wonder if this shapeless object is also an instrument of labor. You're absolutely right, it's not. It's a sample of the so-called native or self-originated copper occurring in nature. Native copper is the product created by the nature itself with 99.9% .9 copper content. Scientists assume that the first metallurgists began extracting ore and working with it after having found exactly such nuggets, as they represent almost ready-to-use metal. Subsequently, after running out of native copper and in the course of production, they understood that it was possible to get metal from ore. When they found the first native copper, they saw that being close to fire, the material became flexible and viscose and thus could be shaped in a certain way, and the shape remained after it cooled down. So they started making arrowheads, knives and maybe jewelry out of it. How often such naturally occurring nuggets can be found in general? Is it possible to find them today? Native copper is present in the copper ore fields of our region but its percentage is rather small. Naturally, the majority of it was used up by our ancient colleagues. Some scientists believe that during the Bronze Age, more than one million tons of bronze had been manufactured here. Over a million tons? Exactly. And it was before the Common Era. This points to a large-scale production. Could you kindly tell us about these working tools here? Well, let's start with these ones. They are called dops. They are basically stone vessels where they would put ore. Into this dipping here, to crush it and turn it into ore sand or concentrate in modern terms. Like powder? Yes, you're right. This X or hammer looking tool here, or its reconstructed copy to be exact, the ancient people used to hammer ore out of the rock. In other words, it's a mining tool. Yes, to some extent it was the mining chipper of the time. So they moved from the Stone Age to the Bronze Age. The tools became different. Yes, naturally. But they were still using stone tools. 
Indeed, because copper was not a cheap pleasure, so to say. Not very many people could afford axes made of copper. Tell me why these animal shoulder blades are green. You're right in identifying them as shoulder blades. They came from cattle. They are green because at some point they came in direct contact with copper. It is the result of ore oxidation. Archaeologists assume that such blades were used as shovels to extract ore, loading it into something, maybe mixing, pounding and enriching. As we use shovels today. Yes, exactly. So being exposed to copper or some ore particles got stuck on its surface and with time the ore oxidized, giving it this green color that you noticed. And this bone here, did they use it for storing also? Yes, as you can see it also has traces of oxidation. Most likely it was somehow used in ore processing too. Quite possibly they mixed ore with it or used it during ore flotation. Copper oxidation took place this way or another. What about this stone here? It has quite an unusual shape. This is one of the items of our pride and probably one of the best archaeological exhibits that we have in our museum. It is the so-called casting mold. Do you see the deepening in it? Yes. Can you guess an axe handle shape? Here, unfortunately, one part of it got chopped off still in the ancient time. Yes, based on the overall shape's direction. So they would pour melted bronze into the mold, leave it for cooling and voila! You have an axe handle. There were multiple casting molds for manufacturing, for example, daggers, knives, arrow spearheads, etc. In other words, this is a complete kit with all the tools used for raw processing and casting depicting the whole procedure. Yes, the whole cycle of production from beginning to end. For example, this axe handle, we can see the full production process from extracting ore, enriching it, crushing, melting and pouring into the mold. We don't have the actual furnace exhibited here, as it was quite large in size. Okay, many thanks for the details and the interesting story. All the best to you and many more new finds. Thanks. So, we have abundant evidence of ancient metallurgical production in central Kazakhstan in front of us. Bronze products, instruments of production and processing of ores and even elements of metal melting furnaces. The actual furnace is the only element missing in the picture. Let's go to the settlement of Taldisai and visit the place where the ancient metal workers actually used to live. Unfortunately, the first snow covered the land in Jeska's gun right then and it became impossible to see the ancient furnaces with our own eyes directly at the excavation site. However, fortunately, archaeologist Aydar Iskakov came to Jeska's gun for some business and kindly agreed to show the replica of a metallurgical furnace recreated by scientists on the premises of Ulitao National History, Culture and Nature Museum Reserve. We are now in Marken Torregelden Mining History Museum. He was the honored veteran of the Great Patriotic War and founded the museum. The museum is unique first of all because it's open air and second of all because its exposition consists of artifacts from the British time and the Soviet Union. Once Russian merchant Nikon Ushakov bought a copper ore field from Babe Shiagbi Bakanshin and then resold it to the brothers Ryazanov. They in their turn rented it out to British companies at the time. That was the time when the industrial scale production of copper alloys began in these parts. In general, metal production in our region started at least in the second millennium BC. That is, during the Bronze Age, ancient specialists were already able to produce various instruments of labor out of copper. As a matter of fact, these furnaces here date back exactly to the Bronze Era. There were two types of furnaces, elevated or above ground and underground ones. This one is the replica of a furnace from Atasu. It allows to see how the ancient people examined and applied the process of alloy production. How exactly did they do it? They would take pieces of crushed ore and melt them at 1200 degrees temperature. 
Maydala ona ju ju prosesine nayirledin dürgüzlet kursetim. Then they would pour it into special molds prepared in advance. Spiran, darrow hands and many other things. Bugün arnaya nanda ni kurkir koyulat. O şu kurkir men yana ana niyet oturup bu arnayı temperatura gadiğin cetti diyende. Yani o yüzden mas mangyekus graus temperatura da balkı doğru. Sol temperatura ne cetti kusursun arnayı o sonda kontrol artık kovdan oturup son men katar o yüzden nanda kalp tarbulat kıyatın arnayı dayın dalgan sol kalp targa sonda yana balkı kaniye al alıp yana kıyıp sonda niyede Bimdar jasağın, onun için de jana zibin uştar, sadak uştar. Çal paytanda bu kul prosesin beren durgusgende. In the course of perfecting the procedure, they also invented a heating system. That is, the hot air passing through the piping was used for heating purposes also during the cold season. Did they heat all the houses around this way? No, only the ones close to the furnace. It appears that the first prototype of central heating was created by Jeska's gun metallurgists thousands of years ago. Never mind that before it was believed that it was invented by Romans who used to build extensive networks of heating channels going out from a single central furnace. We also know about Korean heating systems known as Ondol and the Chinese underground decan furnaces. However, the fact is that the former appeared only 2000 years ago and the Chinese Chinese use their underflow channels to merely heat a sleeping bed near the hearth. So the process of melting metals utilized at modern plants originates from these ancient furnaces. Absolutely right. In addition to that, these artifacts prove that our ancestors already in antiquity were able to professionally extract and produce metal and manufacture metal items. Having completed an unforgettable raid along the traces of ancient metallurgists, the expedition team was almost ready returning back home when unexpectedly Raushan Kaparova, director of Jeska's Gun Historical and Archaeological Museum, invited us to this special exposition of the museum called the Cosmic History. It would seem what space got to do with metallurgy, but we accepted the invitation nonetheless out of curiosity and as it turned out, not for nothing. The exposition is indeed gorgeous. Could you tell us more about it, please? This hall is called the Cosmic History and it was opened in 2016. The time of the opening was intended to coincide with the 25th anniversary of Kazakhstan's independence, the 25th anniversary of the space flight of the famous Kazakhstan astronaut Tokhtar Aubakirov, and the 55th anniversary of Yuri Gagarin's flight. The main objective of the exhibition is to stir the interest towards astronautics among the young generation. By the way, the popular name for Jeska's gun is the city of copper and space. The millennial circle of metallurgy history has finally closed. Once upon a time, in the childhood of the world, this steppe of central Kazakhstan gave birth to ancient metallurgy technologies. Rather primitive, but still very important for mankind. They started their way exactly from here. And later, after several thousands of years, they returned back to the source, to their historical homeland in the form of perfect rocket technologies of the 20th century. To go even further, towards new destinations. The stars. Space. The paths to the vast and open universe had been paved by the ancient metallurgists who lived in our land. The road is always full of surprises. In the beginning of the expedition, we could reasonably guess that the paths of metal dissemination would take us to different corners of the world. But who would have thought that we would need to factor in personal hygiene and care into the equation? Who would have thought that the innovations of the servants of metal from central Kazakhstan would manifest themselves in urban central heating thousands of years later? And who would have thought that the ways of ancient metal workers would lead humans away from our home planet into distant and fascinating interstellar space? Where else will the path going from the first melting furnace to the space launch pad will take us tomorrow? We shall see.
horse is a loyal companion. Every Kazakh man used to have his own horse. Accordingly, much attention was paid to the riding ammunition. We will now make a traditional saddle. First, we prepare the wooden frame of the saddle. After I scrapped off and thoroughly dried the frame, I proceed to cut the skin using paper patterns. I take the measurements of every part and detail of the saddle. Then I cut out the pattern from thick leather in accordance with measurements. I made the necessary drawings. You can use either a knife or scissors to cut the leather. Pieces of leather coincide exactly the paper patterns. For every part of the saddle, I have prepared a paper pattern. Now I cut the leather, and then I will emboss an ornament on it. I want to apply ornaments on the seat and cantle of the saddle. I draw a line in the center. It helps to keep the beautiful pattern symmetrical. Currently, we work on machines to simplify production. In the old days, the pattern was applied manually, with the help of such a knob. We use a pressing machine for embossing the ornament on the leather. I emboss ornament with the help of a hot press. This method makes the pattern durable. The pattern is ready. I'll measure the leather against the paper template. Then I make holes at the edges of the cow skin. We reached the last hole. I finished putting the leather parts of the saddle together. Then I proceed to making the silver details of the saddle. The saddle is ready. May your horse be a good racer. In the early June, the bright and happy live carpet, consisting mostly of the blooming bulbous and turbious bulbous kinds, slowly transfers its blooming relay to the summer kinds that are not less beautiful and expressive. The uniqueness of Kazakhstan flora is not only in the diversity and variety of kinds. Over 700 plants in our steppes are endemic, which is derived from Greek word of endemos, meaning local, which means these kinds cannot be found anywhere else in the world growing wild. Such plants of Regal's tulip, Mushkitov's creeping shrub, Nidvetskia simirichitskia, Albert's tulip, Almari hawthorn, Iris, Alberti, and many others. Of course, the value of the relic endemic and its beauty match, yet most of them are amazing. grass and shrub community of the lower mountain belt are very spectacular in late spring and early summer. There's nothing like this enchanting botanic phenomenon. 
just as much as one square meter has tens of kinds that are blooming one after another. Saint Fon, onion, desert candle, dittany, zephora, oregano, rose hips, dragon head. No way to list them all. They surround the blooming shrub like a bright colorful necklace. These daring landscape compositions enchant by their perfection, complete color harmony of color and shape. Yes, this is acceptable only to the creator. The beautiful blooming shrubs, creeping shrubs, cover quite a wide area in the grass and shrub community of the lower mountain belt. They are very beautiful and rare kinds. For instance, the Mushketos creeping shrub is included not only in the Kazakhstan Red Book, but to the global one as well. This book is called Rare Plants of the World. The real prima donna in this colorful show is the Mushketos creeping shrub. It looks very well in the shining white crown of the snowy Tianshan peaks. The clouds passing by may only envy the white pink dress of the earth beauty. Mushketos creeping shrub was discovered in 1875. After it was discovered and described, the plant biologists so much liked this decorative shrub that in Europe, in the end of the 19th century, it was growing everywhere in parks and squares. It was commonly used as a decorative plant, but here, unfortunately, it hasn't got a custom as a decorative plant, perhaps because we had a lot of it and no one ever considered it as a decoration plant. By the way, I should say that according to the herbarium materials, Mushketos creeping shrub was growing at the territory of the botanical garden even before it became a botanical garden, which means it is in its original growing area. We have it in our collection now in the botanical garden in the collection of rare species. It grows and blooms very well and we'll keep trying to further breed for gardening. Mushketos creeping shrub can be found only in several gorges near Almaty and nowhere else in the world. This is a rare endemic Zailiski Alatau, and as a narrow strip from 900 to 1,700 meters it passes. It is located on the northern macro slope, it does not reach the southern one. That's why it is included in the Red Book of Kazakhstan was also included in the Red Book of the USSR and the International Red Book. It is amazing how this relic from the Paleogene era that is at least 30 million years could survive near with the giant metropolis. There's a big population in Zailiski Alatau in the Turgin Gorge, in the Isi Gorge and in the Aksai Gorge but further on the sporadic spots of population are distributed throughout the range. The Mushketos creeping shrub was first described by the founder of Batumi Botanic Garden, Andrei Krasnov, and he called it in honor of his friend, the explorer of Central Asia, Ivan Mushketov. Status, rarest narrowly endemic species with reducing population. The plant is included in the Red Book of Kazakhstan and the Global Red Book Rare Plants of the World. Buckwheat family, scientific name of the class, Antrophaxis, translated from ancient Greek as Inutrius, meaning that it's not used for cattle feed, which turned out to be not so bad for the kind evolution. It blooms in May through June. The fruits are three-edged nuts that ripen in August. Mushketov's creeping shrub is an excellent melliferous plant. The product has delicate taste and gentle flower scent. It has no thorns compared to other Kazakhstani kinds. It 
grows very well in culture and blooms from stage of flowers in the fourth year. It is excellent for green decoration of southern cities, although it is used for this purpose very rarely. Too bad. It has no competitors in beauty and modesty. It is protected in the Almaty Sanctuary and the Ili Alatau National Park. Often the same population with Mushketa's creeping shrub has no less decorative pear leaf creeping shrub. However, it's not as famous but as much enchanting while blooming. It can be compared only with a Japanese sakura. Except that the flowers on our creeping shrubs stay much longer. And we do not have a holiday called creeping shrub hanami. Perhaps the thing is in the poor awareness of the population. We hope that our show will fill this gap at least partially. It has a very interesting property. In the beginning of blooming, the buds are slightly green. Then they slowly get pink and in the end, they turn red. Watching this beautiful color iridescence is a pleasure. The flowers have different degrees of pink shades. They're located very densely on long branches. So the small bare leaf leaves are almost invisible. This makes the pear leafed creeping shrub look like a luxurious design bouquet from a distance. It blooms in May. In the desert areas it turns into the creeping kind. Most creeping shrubs finish blooming in May, but the bushy kinds of the creeping shrub keep blooming almost until late October, when all plants prepare for winter. Closer to the fall, in August, when almost all plants finish their blooming, the bright pink flowers of the creeping shrub show up as a pleasant surprise or a reminder about the long past spring. The leaves of this plant are very narrow and short and almost invisible. But the flowers remain on the bush until late October without losing its decorative properties. Its height is up to 70 centimeters. It grows on dry rocky slopes. In culture, the creeping shrub can be very well used for making a live fence, a real live fence. There are not many people who would want to test the sharp thorns of this beauty. Our landscapers are hard to understand. Having such natural beauty, is there a point in bringing delicate Weigelas from Europe that cannot survive our winters? Elite Barberry can be found in the beds of mountain rivers and on blooming slopes in the picturesque gorges of Zailiski Alatau, east of the Almaty city. You can't just walk by this bush while it's blooming. Kazakhstan has seven kinds of barberry. Barberry provides good food coloring. It is a tanning material. And the Ili barberry takes special place among all barberries of Kazakhstan. This kind is almost endemic in Kazakhstan. It grows only along the Ili River Basin, which is mostly Kazakhstan. And only in a very small portion of the upstream Ili River, it touches China.
the bunches of bright yellow flowers get visited by busy bees. Barberry is an excellent honey plant. Its very well-developed root system protects the slopes from landslides. Another particular property of Ili Barberry is that it can survive the soil salinization. Usually no fruit plant can feel very well on salty soils, but it is a home for Barberry. The fruits are used in the food industry. Cooking. There's no good pilaf without barberry. It is widely used in medicine to reduce blood pressure, in treatment of kidneys and liver. It cleans the blood very well. It is valued for its anti-aging properties. The decorative properties of the bush are also valued. Barberry is beautiful during the philological stage of vegetation. In spring, it is a bright and lush blooming. Summer is the development and fullness of the cherry-colored fruit beads. Further on, the berries get ripe and the plant provides unforgettable colors of the fall leaf shedding. The Ili Barberry was included in the Red Book of Kazakhstan back in 1980. The problems causing the reduction of population in its aerial are industrial and anthropogenic. The change of the Ili Barberry aerial is related to the construction of the Kapshigai Water Reservoir and with the construction of the water reservoir on the Chilik Rover. Simply saying, many populations were drowned and the kind got separated in its aerial. It seems like the things got settled down nowadays, but even today the Ili Barberry is threatened, especially downstream Ili. In the dry years, when our water inflow is not enough, the Ili River level shifts down to one or one and a half meters. The Barberry feeds on the groundwater, which means the groundwater gets as low as the river level. That's why we have to pay close attention and preserve this species, which is taken care of at this moment. Ili barberry is a bush up to three meters tall. Its leaves are oval with dents on edges. Yellow flowers form a brush. It blooms in May and delivers fruits in September. Barberry reproduces by seeds and vegetatively. Status, Red Book of Kazakhstan, endemic kind, population reduces. The line of the May blooming bushes is added with three more kinds of the rose family, briar, cherry, and spirea. They have different flower shapes, crown shapes, but they all have the same content. It is a high decorative value. Briar or rose hips is known for its fruits in the first place. However, the aromatic flowers play a very important role reviving the landscape filling after winter the hungry bees with pollen and nectar. But what's more important is that the briar flowers become a basis for breeding multiple kinds of culture roses that make part of modern life. Also, the dried flowers of briar contain as much medicinal, vitamin, and nutritious elements as its fruits. Tian Shan cherry is the most widespread bush of the wild Kazakhstan kinds. It grows on wild rocky slopes among the grass and bush communities. 
Its height is from 30 centimeters up to one and a half meters. The blooming period is quite long from April till June. The sour and sweet fruits ripen by July. The seeds get distributed by birds and mammals. Wild cherry is also a good honey plant and a very beautiful one. It looks perfectly on the alpine hills. Here they feel like home. It is interesting for science while breeding the drought resistant kinds of cherry. Spear AEL, also called the bride's bouquet, is blooming like cherry from April till June. Tender, greenery, and beautiful flowers make your day better, filling the forest less land with movement, life, and some sort of coziness. Long branches are covered with white flowers, like with snow. The flowers are very small but numerous. That's why it looks like a single lace like tracery. Spear area is widely used in city decoration. It looks excellent in single planting, landscape compositions, and especially in free-growing live fences. And one in the field can be a warrior. This proverb is very well suited for the blooming salt cedar. No other plant can beautify and enliven a quite monotonous landscape. The bright pink color can be seen from a long distance. Tamarisk family, growing areas, sand and clay, alkaline steppes and deserts. Salt cedar is a bush or a small tree up to 5 meters high. It has great value for amelioration and fixing of soils, especially sands. Long blooming period, brightness and color diversity make this kind irreplaceable for landscaping the deserted regions. Preservation of biological diversity of the country where the important part is played by our beautiful blooming bushes is a task not only for the country, it is more of a task for each of us since we are all users of natural resources. Welcome to Unknown Kazakhstan. My name is Daniel Glumov and I'm a discovery hunter. Climbing up to the very top in order to plunge to the very bottom. Reeling up hundreds of kilometers in order to wind off hundreds of years. The 
unknown KZ crew already has a trace of sensational discoveries behind it shared by self-sacrificing scientists and desperate travelers who will once again subject riddles and secrets to the glare of truth. Watch right now, today in our program. What appeared in Europe later than in southern Kazakhstan? How to read the history of the city on the walls of excavations? How much does it cost to build a medieval city? Приветствую, друзья! Я ищу древние монеты. Как сделал бы I salute you, my friends. I'm looking for ancient coins, as any curious, greedy and meticulous tourist on this ground would do. And it is difficult to do it, but it's easy to find ceramics, perhaps Iranian, Chinese or Indian. There is a plenty of this stuff here since I'm near the greatest city of the Middle Ages in Central Asia, Otra. For a long time, Otra was in desolation and oblivion, and it would be completely lost if in 1969 archaeologists did not begin their research. So they managed to discover and understand how medieval baths, mosques and residential blocks looked like, to get an idea of how the main city gate looks like. And now Otra is getting its new construction life restoration begins here. Specialists are trying to restore the medieval appearance of Otra. But won't we miss any nuances because the city itself began to exist before the Middle Ages? Let's take a closer look. Let's try today to cut through the Ultra Fortress like a cake and look at all numerous cultural layers. In fact, we know that the city collapsed and was rebuilt more than once, and this couldn't pass without a trace. When did Otra appear? How is this being recorded? What is known about how it began? At the end of 1969, the first stratigraphic exploring pit was laid here, which cut through all the main layers, beginning from the 18th century and the lower part, near the fortress wall was fixed by materials, according to ceramic finds, somewhere around the 3rd century. Below there is a layer of ash where ceramics were not found, but there was a large layer of ash. Based on this, it is believed that the city originated in the 1st century AD. Let's call this time the foundation of the oldest legendary city. What attracted the first settlers on this piece of land? Naturally, the settlement was formed due to the agriculture being produced here, an irrigated agriculture, a sedentary agricultural form of life that could not arise here without water. The first people who came here could not predict the fate of the legendary city to their settlement, although they were counting on dividends from this step life. Do not forget that by that time in this area, the Great Silk Road was beating with all its charms and horrors. There is the steppe nearby where nomads used to live that constantly raided sedentary agricultural people. They robbed them and left. Because of this, people began to build fortress walls. With the development of the Great Silk Road, caravans wanted security. Is it known when the walls took the first siege? When the earliest siege happened? When the city became interesting for raids and robbery? On the stratigraphic exploring pit, which cut through the layers from the 8th to the 1st centuries, the earliest layers of destruction are associated with the 8th century. There is simple wind sand there and it is felt. People's life leaves a completely different layer. And now the flows and everything says that the city remained destroyed in this period. This is due to the conquest of the Arabs and the Muslims that overtook the area. According to archaeologists, much has changed in Otra in the 10th century. We see that the city has grown in 10th, 12th centuries and it became necessary to surround the entire suburb with a wall. Actually, it was impossible to live without a wall in the Middle Ages. Therefore, everyone tried to live behind the wall. Endless wars, sectarian wars led to the fact that the city must necessarily be fortified. This is the fortress wall of the northern 
part of the city, Shakristan. Here a fortified wall, a tower and a rarity. A back door was first revealed. It is evident in the dome that the thickness of the wall is more than 1.5 meters here. It gets thicker to the bottom. The size of bricks is 50 by 30 by 10 centimeters. These are very thick and rock-solid bricks. Apparently, walls of the city became thicker in proportion to the thickness of the wallets of local residents, merchants and sellers. Townspeople began to look differently at what is used in everyday life inside and outside the doors of their houses. In the 10th, 12th centuries, the fortress of Otra meets its main flourishing period in the Karakanid epoch. The palaces, mosques and baths as well as the sewage system appeared on the territory of Otra. By the way, on the territory of residential quarters of that time, such strange objects were also found. And here, dear experts, I have a question for you. What is it? Whatever answer you give, the point of view of archaeologists is this. Excavations showed that in the houses of well-to-do people, in bathrooms, there were toilet bowls. Everyone knows that, at the same time, a crucial, fatal moment for the city has come. During the Karakanid epoch, the heyday of the settlement ends with the invasion of the Mongolian. After destruction, the city gets restored relatively quickly. Here the so-called Mongolian period is being fixed. Here a new empire has been formed, the Mongols. They were against the construction of fortress walls in order to keep Taras in subjection. On the other hand, there was a strong state power which could ensure the safety of cities without any walls. The reign of the Mongols in Otra has been little studied so far, so there is almost nothing to say about what the Mongols brought to its urban culture. But after the collapse of the Golden Horde, golden times have come to Otra. It is these walls, these bricks that we see which date back to the 14th century, the Timurid epoch, the second flourishing period after the Karakanid era. The wall was conical. It narrowed to a meter or meter and a half to the top, and from below it expanded to three to four meters, and below it could have a thickness of seven to eight meters. Now we are at the territory of a mosque of the 14th century. We stand before the Mikab, the part that is present in every mosque. It indicates where to the faithful should spend their namaz. Here are the remains of columns and towers, which formed the facade, the front part of this mosque. And this is the entire territory of the mosque? Yes, this part is the covered part of the mosque. And in front of it, there was a huge square which was supposed to accommodate people who came here on Fridays. Here the residence of Berdi Bek appears. There is a mention that Timur, going on his last trip to China, crossed the Sivaya River and settled in the palace of Berdi Bek. And Berdi Bek, according to written sources, was a Kipchak. His brother Nur ad-Din was a commander of Timur. Нурадин был полководцем у Тимура. Там при раскопках найдены, значит, during the excavation, ceramic tiles with gilding were found there. Very rarity. Chess piece made of ivory was found, and there, typical for the Kipchaks, earrings were found too. Которые характерны и считаются для Кипчаков. And here are the residential blocks of 13th, 15th centuries. Archaeologists have revealed them this season. Appearing here, you immediately get overwhelmed by thoughts and images of that time. How barefoot children ran in these streets, how women were baking cakes in the stoves, and the smell was spreading all over the neighborhood. How old men hoarsely whispered to each other. However, it turns out that here was located a military town. And most likely, only soldiers' strong language after another battle was heard. In the 13th, 15th centuries, a period that is now being studied by archaeologists, it was a garrison right next to the fortress wall. Soldiers drawn their duty and even lived here during the siege. The duty was ongoing, the enemy was standing behind the gate, but the life needed to be continued, even if sometimes it was dangerous. Wow, it flew straight to the feet. Wow, it's still hot. 
А вот здесь вот, кстати, мы в начале раскопок здесь все где-то на метр вышли. And here, by the way, in the course of the excavations, gravel pits were recorded. There is an assumption that at that time these burials were made. It was not possible to go and bury people outside the city in an ordinary city cemetery, since there was an enemy army at that moment. Это как в этот момент было войско противника. Если для отрара определенная норма пол метра is there a certain norm for Otra? Half a meter depth for an archaeologist means 50 years back in history. It is different in different parts. There is no clear binding. Here in this section we see a depth of just over 5 meters, and in its stratigraphy we see about 8 construction horizons. Each of them can correspond to different ages. Suppose at the top it's 17th or 18th century, half a meter below the 16th century, another meter is the 15th, something like that. Допустим, полметра ниже, там метр ниже, это уже 16 век, еще метр 15, вот так вот. Сделал срез стены высотой 8 метров и наблюдай историю городища. You can cut a wall 8 meters high and observe the history of the site of ancient settlement in all its glory. Just know how to read it. And what do we see? It is evident that the town had black and white stripes in its fortune. The black belt, which runs throughout the excavation in the residential block, indicates that there was a big fire here. It is more prosaic and not so tragic with the white stripe. There supposedly was a garbage pit, at the bottom of which once, for some purpose, people laid out reeds. This is organic. Let's try further trace the secular events along the wall. They are fixed on every wall. Just the sun has dried them. Still everywhere these layers are visible at this level, even there in that direction. In fact, a layer of fire goes along the whole section, meaning that it was a pretty big fire, maybe a block or the district, or maybe the whole town was in fire. Other city fires are also fixed. This is a fire of the 17th century connected with the conquest of the Jungar. This has greatly affected the further history of Otra. Already after the death of Timur, people began to leave Otra and it gradually emptied, began to collapse, turning into ruins. Now restorers make it very attractive for tourists. Masters reconstruct the appearance of the city of the Timurid era. Towers with loopholes, the gate arch and part of the walls have already been restored. The design of the gate remained the same as described in archival documents. There are photos preserved. What do you think? How much does it cost to build a medieval city and how much time will it take? Now nearly 60 million have been spent for three years. For how many bricks? For more than 100,000. Each of them costs 300 tenge. How much time will it take for the plant to produce bricks for towers and the entrance lobby? We can produce one to 200,000 for a year. A whole year is needed for a modern plant to produce bricks for such a construction? Yes, it's handmade. It takes 15 days to make 450 to 500 bricks. Then what should be said about the ancient builders? Right. In ancient times, city builders worked with filling. Built well, if you live in the city, if you want to stay alive. Mongolian troops were conquering the city of Otra for half a year. History shows that the city was also captured later. Here is the main gate. Today, after the reconstruction, will it withstand the Mongolian siege? How do you think? I'll say with certainty that it will. We used only high-quality materials from the bottom to the top, so any siege, catapult, even an earthquake will not destroy it now. What are the Mongols? What are the Jungas opposite to time? The time is now the main enemy of Otra. It is impossible to be sure of how much will it take to restore the site of the fort and whether it will be possible to save it. And yet the hope remains that in the new old look Otra will retain the greatness that delighted the travelers who used to be here in the Middle Ages.
TV. Feel the power. Kazakh President Nursultan Nazarbayev met with Donald Trump 